Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the PyCon APEC Thailand 2021. This is greeting from Hong Kong, and I'm Scotty. Today, I'm going to talk about Python and computer vision from cancer classification to industrial application. So once upon a time, there was a group of scientists who doesn't like Python and like Pigeon. So they came up with an idea to use Pigeon to do deep learning. And here is the deep learning and fragment by the Pigeon. A Pigeon is put inside a cubic box and in front of the Pigeon is a screen showing the microscopic image. The Pigeon have to tell whether this is a cancer image or not, and then pressing the left or the right button. If you press the correct button, then a piece of food will appear as a reward. But if it fails, then the process repeats again. The scientists found that after two weeks of training, the pigeon managed to reach 85% accuracy, and the pigeon can even correctly identify cancer image that they have never seen before. And by pulling in a group of four pigeons, they actually reached 99% accuracy. So it's really amazing. But today is not about Pigeon, it's about PyCon. So let's go back to Python. To introduce myself, my name is Scotty Quark. I was born, I was grew up in Hong Kong, and I'm a software developer and a co-founder of Sebit. Sebit is a company that develops AI and computer vision solutions. Make sure you check out our website in www.sebit.world. And by the way, we are hiring. In today's talk, uh, I have prepared two different topics on computer vision. Uh, the first one is about computer vision applied in cancer classification research. And the second part is about computer vision applied in a real life industrial environment. Now let's dive into part one, computer vision in cancer classification. To give everyone a bit of context, uh, this kind of computer vision problem is closely related to a medical field called histopathology. And what is histopathology? Uh, histopathology is a branch of pathology that specializes in dealing with um, histological structure in an abnormal tissues. So in a very layman term, this is about study of microscopic image for the sake of disease diagnosis. And how do we acquire this kind of microscopic image? Let me use a breast cancer as an example. The doctor will use either a needle or a surgical procedure to sample some tissues from the patient. And uh, this is called a biopsy. And from there, we get a tissues and we put that into a fixation solution to prevent the decay and to preserve the cell structure in a lifelike form. Then after six to 12 hours, the tissues will be put into a mold uh, filled with paraffin wax. And we wait for the wax to cool down and harden, then it end up with a paraffin block that firmly embed the tissue inside it. Then we can use a sectioning machine to cut thin slices from the paraffin block. And then the doctor will pick the best cross-section and mount them on a glass slide. Now, because uh, human tissues normally don't have any colors or pigments, so they're basically colorless. Therefore, in order to relieve the cell structure, uh, we will need to use different chemicals to stain some colors on the cell. This is called a staining protocol. One of the most common staining protocol is H&E staining, and that gives rise to the uh, purplish and reddish color that we usually see in microscopic slides. Then the final step, of course, is to have the doctor examine the slides on a microscope. But nowadays, with the advancement in technology, uh, the glass slides can be digitally scanned using a scanner. And that kind of scanner is called a whole slide scanner. And how does a whole slide scanner work? It's basically a robotic microscope. 
that uh, scan through the whole image tie by tie. And then the machine will combine all those small image into one single big image. That is the whole slide image, the WSI file. Now WSI file is a multi-resolution file format where you can zoom into different region and different resolution in just a single file. It is very much like uh, on Google map that you can zoom in or zoom out to see both the high level overview as well as the low level details of different region. And in Python, uh, it is very easy to read uh, this file. Uh, we got a great library called Open Slide. Uh, you just need to pip install it, uh, import it in your code, then you can do various things with it. For example, so you can get the thumbnails of the image and you can extract a specific region at a specific zoom level. And what you get back is a pixel array that you can manipulate like normal OpenCV or NumPy array. Now we have all the image, we have the pathologist and we have the medical knowledge, then what's the problem? The problem is, first of all, uh, to get an accurate diagnosis, uh, we require expert and a uh, well-trained pathologist. And this kind of expertise is usually hard to train and is a scary resource in an organization. And secondly, uh, the image is so large in host light image. So it is a very tedious and time consuming task for a doctor to go through the whole image by naked eye. And thirdly, uh, because the decision involves human, so sometimes for marginal cases, uh, the, the diagnosis results may have some variation depending on the expert's experience and judgment. And due to all these difficulties, computer scientists trying to use computer vision and deep learning to help. One of the examples is the ICA 2018 BACH competition. It is a global competition organized in Portugal, and the objective for the competition is to develop a method for auto detection of cancer region in breast cancer image. The competition consists of two parts, part A and part B. In part A is about classifying a small region into four class, normal, benign, in situ carcinoma and invasive carcinoma. Each class correspond to a different stage of the cancer progression. And we were given 400 image to train a four class classifier. Then part B is about using the part A classifier uh, across the whole huge host light image. So as to delineate all the cancer versus non-cancer region in the whole file. Let's take a look at the methodology that I use in this research. In part A, it is basically a image classification problem. So I start with trying different classification models such as uh, VGG, uh, Inception or ResNet. And the goal is to find out which is the best model for this problem. It turns out that uh, Inception ResNet V2 is a pretty good option. So I use it throughout this research. And then for data, uh, I use typical methodology to augment it, such as rotation and flipping and color perturbation. Here, I think the color perturbation is quite important in the processing of pathology image because the, uh, the color tone of each laboratory uh, could be heavily biased uh, due to their staining protocol. So by adding HSV color perturbation into the data, you can have a better general, generalized model. And in terms of hardware, I use two GPU card to train the model. It converge quickly within half an hour and arrive at a 0.79 accuracy. We move on to the part B data. Now, part B data is a much larger set of data because is extracted from uh, the huge host-like image. So I use 
and the approach called hard example mining to trim down the part B data. The, the way it worked is that uh, I use part A classifier to classify part B data. And for those part B data that result in a wrong prediction are exactly the data that we want to extract. And those are the so-called hard examples. To train the final classifier, I sample 6,000 image from the hard examples and I combine it with the part A data to, to retrain a new classifier. And this final classifier become the, uh, the final classifier that we use in the prediction. Then to generate the prediction heat map, we just need to slide the final classifier across the whole slide image, tie by tie, like a typical sliding window detection algorithm. Then we can port the probability into a heat map and we end up with a heat map showing the cancer probability, like the one that's shown here. At the final step, we uh, quantize the heat map into a four class uh, uh, map using four threshold. And this is a picture of the final result of this algorithm. Now the methodology itself seems uh, straightforward for enough. But uh, when it comes to implement that in Python, it is not a trivial work and it took me a few months. And here is the software stack that I used uh, during that development. Uh, first of all, for OS, I use uh, Ubuntu and uh, I use an encoder to manage my virtual environment dependency. And IDE, I prefer using IntelliJ. And of course I use Git to version control my change. And for Python libraries, um, we are using all the typical like data science library like KREX, uh, TensorFlow, and uh, the image processing library like OpenCV, NumPy, OpenSlide, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Pillow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And lastly, I use IPython Qt console to test my code. And here I want to particularly highlight uh, what is a uh, IPython console. Now, oftentimes I see a lot of people just know about Jupyter Notebook and they use Jupyter Notebook for all the problems. But personally, when I deal with a computer vision problem, I tend to use IPython console a lot more. Um, so in case you don't know what is IPython console, it is a, I mean, a Python console, a Python command line interface where you can type Python code, uh, but you also get all the fancy function that you get in Jupyter Notebook, such as syntax highlight and the, uh, and the graphic inline and also the auto-completion, that kind of stuff. But uh, in IPython console, I think I get a much smoother and responsive uh, user experience uh, from, the, from, from the command line. But the catch of this is that you need to manage to cook yourself, you have to save the code yourself. That's why I usually use IPython console together with my IDE. So in case you haven't tried it, uh, feel free to try out the IPython console. Maybe you also like it. Now let's look at the results of the research. So part A, again, is about a four class classification. I managed to win the first place um, with an accuracy of 0.87. Uh, which is not too bad uh, for a four class classification. Um, and in part B, that I need to del delineate the cancer region. Again, I managed to win the first place by quite a large margin. And here you can see uh, a sample of the part B result. On the left hand side is the uh, ground truth label by the doctor. The right hand side is the protection by the program. You can see the program managed to delineate the cancer region pretty well. And how about if we compare the, the AI program versus the human? Now, uh, we, we noticed that uh, actually, uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, we can see that uh, this is the AI program accuracy in part A, which is point X7 for the first two team. One of, one of them is me. And then we compare to the human expert here, uh, the average accuracy, uh, the AI, AI program is comparable to human. But when we compare it with the, uh, those uh, more experienced uh, doctors and experts, 
they're having 0.96 or 0.95 accuracy. So the AI program is still far from satisfactory when compared with uh, the uh, experienced expert. And secondly, if we look at the specificity, uh, all the humans are, are having a quite good, uh, a very good specificity. But all the AI program, basically, they underperform in terms of uh, specificity. What that mean is that, uh, well, first of all, specificity uh, is, uh, could be interpreted as kind of a false detection rate. So, so the meaning is that uh, most of the AI program has a, quite a lot of a false detection, but human, uh, maybe a more conservative, so they tend to have less false detections. And this point will conclude uh, the first part of my presentation. I hope that uh, this has given you a general idea of um, what is digital pathology and how do we acquire the microscopic image, how do we process the image, and how computer vision can be applied in this kind of research. If you have, if you have interested in, uh, in this research, uh, feel free to check out the paper published by the organizer here in this link. Now let's move on to the second part of this talk. In the part one, I talk about computer vision applied in medical research. Now in the part two, I would like to share with you another perspective of computer vision, which is about applying it in a real life application. <clears throat> Now, long story short, after the medical research I did in 2018, I co-founded the company with a few partners, and the company is called Sebit. In Sebit, uh, we specialize in developing tailor-made computer vision solutions for our clients. And over the past few years, we have created quite a lot of different computer vision solution and have quite a lot of lessons learned. And so today, based on those experience, I have summarized here a few key factors that I believe is crucial for successful implementation of computer vision. They are hardware, software, camera view angle, and data collection. And I'm gonna go through them one by one with you. <clears throat> to start with, uh, the first thing is the hardware. Um, as a data science guy, we all know that we love to use a lot of GPU servers to do model training. But when it comes to real life production deployment, whether we use a, a GPU server or not, it really depends on <clears throat> the performance and the number of cameras that we need. And oftentimes it also depends on whether the client has the space to house such uh, big servers on their premises. Well, many people would go for a cloud solution, but uh, I'm more into building uh, our own GPU servers. Ex this is especially true for computer vision projects. And, and there are a few reasons. The reason number one, uh, GPU cloud is expensive. If your application need to run 24 hours a day for several years, then building your own GPU servers can actually be more e cost effective in the long run. And reason number two is that for mission critical detection application, um, such as analyzing a 4K resolution at a 30 frame per second, then if you do it over a cloud, over a streaming uh, LAN cable, I mean, streaming to the internet, um, the bandwidth and latency maybe is too bad and cannot, is a, not an acceptable solution. And finally, uh, People may have concern in privacy. So sometimes it's a really good idea to run our detection locally on the client's premises. Um, and then nowadays GPU servers um, is not hard to build. There are vendors that can build a whole server for you. All you need is some basic uh, Linux knowledge and computer network knowledge to maintain the server. But in return, what you get is a very powerful machine that you can run a lot of AI models. 
Moving on to another hardware option is the edge device, edge computing device. Now, edge computing device is referring to those uh, small devices that uh, can perform the computation physically near the data source, which is near the edge of the computer network. That's why we call it edge computing. Nowadays, many edge devices are powerful enough to run certain kind of AI models. Those devices, including like Jackson Nano, Jackson Xavier, or even the Mofidis AI accelerated chips, or the latest uh, OcuCam released by OpenCV, they all are powerful enough to run some AI model. Now, the good thing to use uh, Azure AI device is that the whole processing, that means the whole AI model and the image capture happen right inside the device which is locally installed on the premises of the client. And that means there's no need to stream any image or videos to any other servers or cloud. And that eliminate a lot of privacy concern for many clients. <clears throat> and it also means that you don't need much network bandwidth to run those device. And all you need is a tiny bandwidth that uh, used to send out the detection alarm or detection results. And based on my observation so far, this approach uh, is becoming uh, more popular. And I think it's becoming a trend in computer vision projects. But bear in mind that uh, this device has a learning curve to pick up. And uh, you also need to use uh, vendor specific tools to convert your AI model to a format that can be run on the device. And this device can only run uh, certain small AI models because the computation resource is limited in this device. Now, speaking of uh, edge device integration, of course, we'll talk about cameras as well. Now, apart from the uh, standard uh, CCTV surveillance camera, uh, actual camera modules is also a common option that we use in many of our computer vision projects. Now, depending on the specific need, there are a large variety of different sizes, different resolution, different frame rate, and light sensitivity cameras that we can choose. For example, to capture a fast moving object, we may need to trade off the resolution in return for a higher frame rate in the camera. And then in some project uh, that require high resolution, we may need to trade off the cable length to ensure a high bandwidth and a stable signal from the cameras. So in real life computer vision project, the designer has to know our cameras really well. And, and as an R&D team, we actually keep on studying the collection of different cameras to ensure we have the best choice in the coming projects. And moving on to software, which is, the, which is the next key factor. Uh, we use a lot of Python in our coding. Basically, all the major, the majority of our code is written in Python in our project because Python has all the native support to all those deep learning libraries such as TensorFlow and PyTorch. And in OS, we uh, all of our application are running on Linux, uh, such as Ubuntu, because Linux gives us a very stable machine to manage our application. And Docker is another important skill in my opinion, uh, because in the old days when I used version environment to manage my CUDA version and TensorFlow version, it is such a pain. But when, once I moved to Docker and Docker Compose, I found that it is very easy and uh, more reproducible to manage different kinds of CUDA version and TensorFlow version. So if you are a data scientist and you haven't used Docker, I really recommend you to give it a go. Uh, I think you will find enough of it. And lastly, uh, I'll talk about GStreamer and DeepStream, which we use a lot in our project. Now, what is GStreamer? GStreamer is a pipeline-based uh, multimedia framework. GStream ha has a very long history, actually. It was re first released in 2001. And still, nowadays, it's still being actively used and maintained today. And for those who uh, deal with image, you may not know about GStreamer, but for those who work on video analytics, 
basically GStream, I think is one of the uh, very useful tools that uh, we, we, we will not miss it. So one of the key benefit of using GStreamer to process video is what we call the zero copy approach. It basically means that the video frames does not need to be copied multiple times during the processing uh, because the GStreamer has a special memory called frame buffer that holds the frame in the memory. And it is the pointer to the frame buffer that's being passed along in the pipeline. So there are no memory copy when we process the video across the pipeline. And that results in a much faster program and especially true for video analytics. And based on the GStreamer framework, NVIDIA has uh, developed a software development kit called DeepStream. So it actually packaged a lot of NVIDIA hardware acceleration plugin into this framework. So by using DeepStream, uh, we just need a bit of configuration and a bit of coding, then we can quickly create some video analytic application. And that video analytic application could include all the essential functions such as decoder, encoder, uh, object detections, and object tracking. And with the Python binding in the deep stream, we can get all the metadata and, and then do uh, our business logic in the Python code. And more importantly, uh, the, G, the deep stream plugin can run in most of the NVIDIA discrete GPU, as well as the Jackson uh, Edge device. So it's a really useful uh, software uh, for uh, video analytics. Now come to the first uh, point that I want to highlight is the camera view angle. Now in real life uh, application, oftentimes the engineer has the flexibility to pick and to set the camera angle that he or she wanted. And in many cases, we find that the camera view angle is actually the key factor that determines the success or failure of your project. So in the beginning of our project, we usually spend a lot of time to figure out what's the correct camera settings and camera angle, because it is so important. So how do we define a good camera view angle? A good camera view angle is not just about uh, capturing all the pixels or all the objects, but it's more about how you frame the problem correctly. A good camera view angle can frame the problem into a representation that is easy for your AI model to process. Whereas a bad camera view angle will frame the problem into a more difficult problem for your AI model to handle. So in my opinion, uh, camera view angle is one of the key in computer vision project. And the fourth key Factor, I think, is the data collection. Um, in our experience, fine tuning your model using real world data collect on site can always boost your accuracy significantly. So, for clients that require high accuracy, we always collect real data on site for training. And uh, we always face the same problem of how to collect samples for rare, rare events, such as accidents. And based on our experience, there are sometimes a lot of ways to simulate uh, those rare events in the real environment. So it's all up to you to come up with creative ideas to simulate uh, the rare events in the real environment. And there is always a temptation to settle on an imbalanced data set because the rare events are so hard to collect. And then there's a temptation to use uh, different kind of data science skills to enrich the data. For example, you may want to enrich, you may try to upsample your rare events, or you may try to augment your rare events to create more data. But in my opinion, these are usually bad ideas. The reason being that uh, if your initial sampling size of the rare events is already small, then if you upsample or you augment your, your small data set, then you're just multiplying the bias of the small sampling that you sample. So in my opinion, always try to come up with creative idea uh, to collect a balanced data set. 
Today, I've um, prepared a case study uh, from one of our real life computer vision project. In this project, uh, our client wanted to develop a computer vision system that detects human fall on the escalator. Because in some environments, such as wet market in Hong Kong, where the floor is a bit slippery and there's a lot of senior citizen riding the escalator, the risk of a human fall is pretty high. And the facility management team uh, wanted to be informed as soon as possible once this kind of fatal accident occurred. Now the challenge here is uh, there are more than a thousand passengers riding this escalator every day. So by just 1% of uh, false alarm rate, it translates into more than 10 false alarms per day. So which, which are very annoying and uh, rendered the system useless from the, uh, the operation perspective. But on the other hand, if there's just one accident out of the 1,000 passengers, then the system must, must be able to detect it correctly. Our R&D team performed a search of prior art, but unfortunately, none of the existing algorithms seem to be convincing, and none of them seems to be able to achieve a high accuracy at the same time with low false alarm rate. So with the support of our clients, uh, we did a lot of uh, explorations and experiment, and we figured out that um, actually within a certain region of inches, the fall detection classifier can achieve a very high accuracy at an extremely low false alarm rate. And this observation actually echoes what I mentioned earlier. The camera view angle help you to frame the problem to a better representation that your AI model can handle. Now, writing on this uh, observation, uh, we came up with this design where an array of camera, low resolution camera will be installed right on top of and along the escalator. Each of this camera was tuned to capture a specific narrow region of inches where our classifier is performing at its best accuracy. And because each camera by itself handles a small region of interest and is a self-contained unit, so it's a perfect fit to apply edge computing device. And what you see here in this picture is the uh, equipment that we fabricate. On both ends, you can, uh, there is an edge computer attached with uh, cameras. So all the computation and camera and the image capture happen right inside the box. And therefore there are no video being uploaded to the cloud and the privacy of the passengers can be better protected. The installation of that equipment is also a non-trivial problem. In Hong Kong, the way we do it is using a bamboo scaffolding. Uh, a bamboo scaffolding is uh, set up on top of the escalator and our installation team is uh, install and mount the equipment on top of the ceiling, on top of this scaffolding. And here is the result after the installation. You can see two columns of uh, camera array nicely installed on the ceiling right on top of the escalator. And this equipment gives a magnificent, magnificent view uh, of the image. And here's how it looks like. You can see that uh, each of the subregions of the escalator are nicely captured from exactly top-down view angle. And all of them have a similar field of view. And when we stitch all this image together like this, you can see the passenger moving from one camera to another camera seamlessly. And now it comes to the data collection part. Uh, we all know that human fall is a rare event and it's very hard to collect sufficient samples. So we came up with an idea to hire stuntmen. So we hire stuntmen to simulate fall on the real escalator. And this enables us to collect sufficient samples of real human fall performed by the stuntmen. And then we end up with a balanced data set to train our classifier. 
After all these hard work, and this is the final outcome, you can see uh, it's a demo. The actor starts from the left-hand side. The green bounding box indicates a normal situation. But when the actor fall down on the floor, the bounding box turns red. And then uh, there's a small dot on the camera. That is the camera alarm. And this the actor has caused trigger the alarm uh, along all the cameras. Now, as we move along the corresponding camera, alarm is being triggered. And once these actors stand back up again, the bounding box turns green, and that means it's normal and there's no alarm. Now he try again on the other escalator that's going up. Uh, it's a green bounding box that he's standing, so it's a normal situation. And then once when he fall down again, the bounding box turns red, and he trigger alarms in the corresponding cameras. Now he stand up again and turn green again, and this is the last trial. So he fall down again and bounding box turned red and then the camera triggered an alarm. And when it stand back up again, it back to normal, the green bounding box. And that's the uh, effect of the detection. Now to quantify the, the performance, the accuracy of this system is actually 90%. And the most impressive thing is that the specificity is higher than 99.9%, which means that the system is very accurate, but at the same time, it has a very low false alarm rate. And then here I conclude the second part of my presentation. I hope that this has given you a general idea of how computer vision is being applied in real life application. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me in one of these channels. And uh, finally, uh, thank you for having me in the PyCon APEC Thailand 2021. I wish you guys enjoyed the rest of the PyCon APEC in this year. And let's go to the Q&A section. shy um, in the audience I will be talking a little bit more about you know some of the frameworks and libraries that you will use on a general level um, mm. maybe hardware advice mm. and uh, you know a little bit more about uh, the research on uh, the applications of uh, accuracy for mm. cancer uh, demensification so that's uh, the questions that I had for you oh thank you Sarah. <laughs> I hope that I can answer of course of course I, I watched your talk three times because I was so fascinated. I even brought my husband, who is an engineer, to watch oh. it as well. And we're going, whoa, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Do you need to share any screen, actually? Or do you need to try to share the slides or not? Uh, I don't think so. But if you want to, you can. But I don't know if we are able to in this uh, platform. Yeah. Yeah, we are. So there's a um, present now option that you can see um, in the one next two settings. Let me try. Maybe we don't need it, though. But let me try. Let's see. Let me see. Okay. <clears throat> Saru, you're going to give a countdown on when we're starting the recording? So I can Actually, bring my game face on. So I actually started recording. <laughs> no. <laughs> no worries, no worries. We'll give it a few more minutes for uh, the attend uh, audience members to come. Sure. This is exciting. I'm so excited. <laughs> Oh, we have somebody that says hello. It's Rose. Hi, Rose. You're in the audience. Okay. Let's do this. Oh, 
Scotty, welcome. Thank you for joining me for today's Q&A session uh, and also the PyCon community. In, Scotty, you're the co-founder of Sebit um, that specializes in delivering smart uses around AI and computer visioning solutions in everyday life in Hong Kong. So thank you, thank you again, Scotty, for the great talk that you, you delivered for us in exploring the two part scenarios of applying medical research and then the applications of how the same methodologies or approaches can be broken down to industrial and consumer use. So thanks for coming and thanks for having, uh, we're, we, we're honored to, to be here um, and to be graced with your talk. I wanted to kick things off with a couple of questions um, to begin. Um, in part one of your talk, what were some of the key findings or setbacks when you were exploring the frameworks or libraries to use? Oh, uh, the key findings. So um, let me think of it. So, um, you mean in terms of the programming libraries? Or yes. Generally yeah. Yeah. The library. Because I, I think I, I was using QRX at, at that time. Uh, QRX, the the, uh, the deep learning library, and that was like back in 2018. So, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's good to learn to try to write uh, like KRX, uh, the KRX, the data load uh, by yourself. Because, uh, for example, in this project, uh, the, the input data is a whole slide image, which is a big file. And then we need to take like, like uh, pieces of a small image from there. So, it's actually good to write your own like data loader that directly load the data from the big image. Because I think currently it doesn't have such a loader. I mean, at least at that time it doesn't have. So I think learning to write a KRX data loader by yourself on your own data is quite useful and make your training more efficient. Yeah. And then right, I, right. Over the, and then over these three years, I figured out that the, the KRX library like, changed quite a lot. And then mm -hmm. uh, some of my code actually uh, no longer runnable nowadays. So another, another I mean, <laughs> kind of finding is that actually it changed so so quickly, those uh, some of the deep learning libraries. So, so uh, just another observation. Maybe we, we take we take our programmers a lot of time to catch up with the changes sometimes in this library. Which is the importance of why we're here and we're always continuing to learn, right? <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome. When we talk about you know the the AI program and the human in terms of accuracy. You know, there's always a big kind of tolerance level or even small gaps. For the first um, use case study, the, the expert's average accuracy that you mentioned was around 0.96% um, when it comes when points or wh wh which is comparable to human expert doctors or those that are trained in the field. And the model that you've discovered was about 0.87 in the AI that you mentioned that is still far from, from satisfactory levels, right? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us um, a little bit more about why that may be the case and are we still light years behind in getting close to human levels of accuracy when we compare machines to experts especially in the field of medical research i see so um yeah uh, i think the uh, in terms of accuracy it seems comparable but when mm. you uh, drill down into the specific matrix such as the uh, specificity which is kind of the force alarm rate and uh, that is like a uh, computer is having more force around. So imagine if you are the patient and then a computer tell you that you have a cancer and then that it is actually a false detection. So it's very, very scary. Right? But then human is very careful in, in that sense. Human will not make a simple like, diagnosis just based on some data. Right? They're very, very careful. So in terms of more like specific uh, detection, at least in my research, Back then, in 2018, like yeah. human is more conservative, a bit, a bit less force alarm. And then this is one perspective. I mean, human is more more human basically when you try to come up with a decision. <laughs> yeah. And secondly, uh, I think for expert, uh, I mean, expert uh, pathologists, they uh, they they have they are still better. I think. I mean, uh, like there, there are cases where it's a boundary case, and marginal cases. And, uh, and or some special cases which not exist in the data set, then obviously the model will not learn it. But a human, based on their experience, they will know it. So, so still human expert with a lot of uh, experience is still better than computer. I mean, uh, and then but I think over time it gets like closer and closer. Like after these few years of research, and there are many medical AI startups that like produce very promising results. I think we are getting closer and closer to. to I mean, near, near human. But uh, I think at the end of the day, 
like when it when it comes to a diagnosis, when you talk with talk to the patient, it's still involved the human's final judgment. To yeah, that's right. That's right. That's there, right. There, there was a, a startup actually that featured a talk at uh, uh, PyCon a APAC. Uh, I think it was mm. yesterday. It was with Dr. Mm. Nuno, a startup in Portugal that was uh, delivering some some libraries and some big data applications on wearable technology. So you're right, there are a few startups that are addressing that that pain point and yeah. also trying to, you know, kind of uh, crack open that big picture. Um, in, in your talk, you mentioned the, the benefits of, you know, when we look at the hardware side of things, uh, of building your own GPU servers on-prem and rather than other cloud to avoid those unnecessary costs and also the latency issues, right? When it comes to building hardware, you know, what kind of investment should we prepare for in hardware on creating our first proof of concept if we do want to experiment with things like as a newbie developer or as a junior or as a startup entrepreneur? What are some tips? I see. I think as a new, I mean, newbie uh, developer or indie developer yourself, I think getting a uh, like a decent GPU card um, um, is good enough. Like for for most of the uh, simple training or mm -hmm. simple exercise. Yeah. Like, uh, if you, I mean, my experience, uh, I've in the, my first PC with the GPU is a very like uh, a small GPU, and then very soon when you get into more. Like you soon, uh, I mean, get out of memory very quickly. So you soon upgrade your card if you continue to learn the deep learning. So, like if you have, I mean, the budget then maybe buy one card but with a uh, more memory and yeah. I mean, slightly higher spec. That will give you a longer time. But it depends on whether you like gonna invest a lot of time. So if you plan to do a lot of uh, deep learning, then just buy one. I mean, good card for yourself for yourself, and then. Uh, uh, for I think for for uh, me, an entrepreneur, or I mean, as a as a small company, like um, I think you you can consider like buy a like a, um, a server that has like four or three cards in one server, which you have more flexibility than like, like you share it by the same team. So, like mm -hmm. for example, in my company, we have a server with a few cards, and then people can share. Like and then the, it's not all, always like the same guy uses. So we share and the same server is more efficient and, and fully utilize the, the whole infrastructure. Of course, awesome, yeah. awesome. Um, I like the fact that you know when we talk about computer visioning and you know capturing devices, um, and and cameras, um, for for a beginner when we think about camera view angles as being one of the most important parts of um, ensuring that images are not skewed and images are accurate and capturing is accurate. Also, perhaps even depth of field, what are some of the type of camera models could we find easily to start the experimentation or our proof of concept? Would you recommend? Actually, um, so I, I use a lot of uh, webcam as well when I do my like the proof of concept. So yes, I can do it now. Webcam. Yeah, the webcam <laughs> It's quite useful for the beginning because, like, you, you plug it plug it into your PC and then your yeah. piece of OpenCV code can directly inter interface with it. Like, because if you do it with uh, those IP cam, you may need to do some IP protocol, configure mm. it up with the username, password, etc. It's quite quite involved. I mean, to, yeah, to tedious. So, yeah. yeah, to start with film, some good USB cam is good, and even USB. I mean, some webcam there are like some uh, some brand that have a very high quality, like. Uh, 4K resolution nowadays, um, mm -hmm. and and they have actually good performance in a dark scenario because I think they tune it like very optimal, such that even in a dark room you have a good live broadcast using a webcam. So nowadays, even 4K webcam things can be used in, in some application. And then, but if, if you want to go for like more industrial one, <clears throat> then I think you have to source it source it from some some factory or things, mm -hmm. some more industrial sure. grade, uh, smaller components. Because those are like smaller cameras that you can customize, like you can specify different lenses, even zoom, and then the size sometimes is very important. Like when we deploy in production, we can't have a huge camera, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then those uh, industrial grade camera will give you uh, like more flexibility in the connectivity. Like when there are cables that you need to go for like ten or twenty meters, like you can't you can't simply use USB cable. You have to use some proper cable. Yeah, and of course, of course. It will be another camera attack, yeah. Awesome, okay, awesome. Yeah. Let's take a look at our audience and see if we have some open questions. Um, Saru, how are we looking with our Q&A and chats? 
trying to find oh, an area. Don't have any questions. Oh, okay. We well, can we keep going because I have a ton of questions for this session. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, when, when we look at the, the, the use cases of part two, which is examining um, some of the, the, I have a very kind of personal curious question, um, examining the type of falls that happen um, when the stuntman was going up and down the escalators and then detecting that fall rate and fall surround. I wanted to ask you, how many stuntmen did you use? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. First of all, we, we, we hire one or two like each time. So we, we, we perform it uh, several times actually. Yeah. And then um, they're actually ladies. I mean, just <laughs> agree. Oh then, wow. Uh, yeah. They can wear different kind of suit, different colors, and yeah. uh, pretend to be a different type of person. Oh, can, that's amazing. Yeah, just from the top down, like camera angle, you, you can't even see the face. You just see the overall appearance. So, so as long as you I mean, as long as the stuntman perform, I mean, wear different clothes, then for the model, it just seems like different people. So the purpose is just to collect different variation of uh, people. So, so that's not just two two stuntmen. The answer is, that, but uh, they, yeah, they perform really professionally. Like, and, like yeah, some very dangerous for. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that that was the case. And you know, when when it comes to like exceptions and handling those type of exceptions, you know, when we're reenacting that model so that our machines are learning and you're you're doing that kind of analysis, what were some cases where it's like, did somebody try to tie their shoelaces and that considered like a false alarm? Or what are some of those learnings that you could share with us? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, you're right. So there are some exceptional cases where it, it attracted the model to believe there's a fall, definitely. For example, is when like in, in a market in Hong Kong, like, people would like to, sometimes they they like uh, pull a, a big object, like for example a trolley onto the okay. escalator, which occupy a huge space. That they have big trolleys because uh, they, they put a lot of things in the trolley and then the whole uh, object is being detected as a huge, huge object which the model somehow like interpret it as a form. So oh, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of cases like that in the beginning. So, uh, and what else? And um, yeah, usually it's big objects that, that cause the alarms. And then, uh, then what, what we can do is actually, uh, uh, we just collect those examples uh, mm -hmm. that we felt back and put it into the data set again and train the model again. So it's kind of like the first part of the talk that I I'd like to talk about hard example mining, which is yep. a similar concept. So you mine all the uh, data that the model failed and then enrich it and then we train it again. And your model will be able to, supposedly, will be able to uh, exclude those those false alarms. So, so actually, it's important to collect those false alarms like in, in real life application. That will make the model as much less like uh, false, false detections. That's amazing. Yeah, definitely boosting the, the accuracy, high accuracy data needs for real real data training, right? Um, and, you know, figuring out those ex experiments beforehand is always better than figuring out after you've built something. So that's amazing. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to like this weekend and uh, PyCon and the kind of uh, contributions they're all making, um, we're coming here to learn. We're coming here to experiment and try things ourselves. Um, I know that you're looking for talent. And what kind of advice would you give to new students in P Python um, where they're, you know, what are some of the parting words of wisdom for us to get started in our experiments and for us to get a career at SEBIT? I see. Uh yeah, I, I think uh, as a in general as a new new learner in, in Python or in any programming, I would recommend uh, like uh, uh, you find a certain problem that you are really uh, genuinely interested in, whether it's a medical or like a data science or finance, whatever problem that you're generally interested in, and then maybe find some like challenge or competition that you can participate, and then you. Mm -hmm. You spend a lot of time to actually work it out and try your best to work it out, and then I think over that process you would then learn some real experience, real hands-on experience, and then by looking at your competitors, you also learn from them how they do better than you. Like if you have that kind of mindset and keep exercising your your skills, your muscles in in Python mm -hmm. and data science, then 
that you will gradually like become an expert. Like, so that's my advice. Like find a, a good and meaningful program that you like, and then like take. I mean, have a take on it and work hard to 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 like win a challenge or a competition. I think it. And at least that's my experience in learning Python. That's how I learn Python myself. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you for those wise words of wisdom. Um, enjoy the rest of uh, the event, everybody. And Scotty, thank you again. And ho I hope to see you at PyCon Hong Kong next year. Um, if you're interested, uh, everyone, Sebit is looking for exceptional talent. So please go to sebit.world. Uh, dash careers to check them out or you could uh, email scotty quok at sebit.world or even follow scotty on github at backslash scotty quok and you'll find him there thank you, thank you. so much for your time scotty thank you sarah for questions thank you sarah thank you scotty. thanks Saru. okay bye everybody bye bye, bye, -bye guys bye.